You know all the car brands, but are you familiar with Russian supercars? No. I don't think they There is it. a Russian supercar. I don't think those exist. That exists. They absolutely do exist. I don't think they do. And with everything going on in, with Russia and Ukraine right now, I thought it would be difficult to get my hands on one of these Russian supercars, but I managed to get one. A new car that transcends every other vehicle. What color is your Lada? What's up guys, Matthew here, Actual Exotic Cars. I thought I would mix things up a little bit and talk about some Lada passenger cars. Again, I have already made a video in the past basically about Lada or Optovaz, if you will, kind of my personal thoughts on them as a company and moving on. But I thought I would specifically talk about the Lada 2103 or the 1500 as it was known in the import scene, made famous by Tristan Tate. This is not a political channel at all. I'm merely just using this for reference, but I thought it would be a good segue to talk about the infamous Lada vehicle. So this is a picture of the Lada 2103. Again, very well known by Tristan Tate. Uh, a couple of clips here. Um, here is a video of a Lada that also went pretty viral. And off it goes. You cannot stop a Lada. So what are my thoughts on the Lada 213? Again, known by its import or export name. Known by its export name as the Lada 1500. And is it something worth buying? Can you buy one? Are they already in the U.S.? What are their prices in, the year, in Europe? What were they sold for? And basically, what is it based off of? Again, Lada, most Soviet cars are basically rip-offs of Western makes, more specifically for the most part ripoff of Fiat's or Italian makes. A uh, good reference for that would be the Stava, the Yugo, the Polsky, so on and so forth. So a lot of 2103, uh, also known as the Giguli, though I would say the Giguli would be more of a lot of 2106 in my mind, but that's just a personal opinion. So 1500 is what it's known for outside of, I guess, the domestic market, which in this case would be the Soviet Union. So the picture of this lot of here, technically the badges would be a 1500, even though it's literally just a Vaz 2103. So that is the Vaz. It is basically a ripoff. So back in the day, Soviet engineers basically bought the rights and the tooling for the Fiat 124 and basically based most of the passenger Ladas off this vehicle. And what they did because of the harsh Soviet terrain and climate, they kind of beef things up a little bit and also simplify them. Obviously, the Soviet Union was not the richest of countries. So these are basically dumbed down, more simple, and actually more beefed up, if you will. When I mean beefed up, I mean suspension, frame rails, so on and so forth. Fiat 124s. Interesting fact, the Fiat 124 was sold in the U.S. So technically speaking, if you wanted to have the same Lada, you could have something extremely similar for the most part, or at least what it was based off of in the U.S. If you get a 124, this is a Spider. obviously it's a little bit different, but some of these have sold in the U.S. And like I said, most the engine transmission, for the most part, most of the mechanical things are going to be about the same as this vehicle. But what if you want the Lada, you want the real deal or the fake real deal <laughs> you want the actual lot of so a few of these vehicles have sold in the u.s this is an example of one doesn't really have a price on it that has sold looks like it's imported from russia uh if you go to bring a trailer you'll see all sorts of lotos i didn't necessarily see any 2103s or 1500 specifically of course most of the lot of passenger cars are very similar so it these cars are rear wheel drive and they're four speed manuals uh there is a couple of variations with the engines I can get, given they're all pretty similar, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, so on and so forth. There aren't really any, obviously, you're not going to get a uh, front-wheel drive or all-wheel, four-wheel drive or anything like that. This is like 70s Soviet <laughs> career-wheel drive, four-cylinder car, suck it up. So that is basically a lot of very simple, uh, very known to be very easy to work on. In fact, a lot of the Western reviews 
for praising, here's an example of a grant of this on the Wikipedia page, extremely serious working instrument, able to operate in the worst conditions, well-made car, capable of being serviced anywhere, even by its owner. As somebody that personally owns a Russian car, I would say the number one concern for me would be quality, but the coolest thing about Russian cars is A, they're beefed up because of the harsh climate, and B, they are very simple to work on. So basically, again, a dumbed down Fiat 124, if you will, and actually a little bit cheaper. So Lada as a company, and I have already covered this in my past video, which I might link down in the description, they did export these to most Western countries. Unfortunately, for some odd reason, they never made it to the US or officially as of yet. So uh, let me see some examples here. You can see there's, these are some Lada 1500s for sale in Europe and just so you can see a price range in Western Europe. Now obviously these are from Western Europe so the prices are going to be a little more larger than or higher than what they should be. So if you find an Eastern European country, let's say Ukraine for example, then 1300 obviously this price range would be a little nicer. Granted the mileage on this thing's crazy. Jeez, 400,000. Um, cool thing about Lada, let's say you wanted to buy one of these vehicles. Let's say you wanted to or whatever here and you wanted to import one of these in the US how would you go about it if it was me what would I personally do and is it even worth importing one of these into the US so this is a very good question awesome thing about Lada compared to most other Soviet vehicles even with everything going on right now with the situation going on in Europe getting parts is still relatively simple so there's a couple websites for Lada a lot of power.com a lot of shop.com there's even more than just that that have some of these, again, ship straight from Russia still. I don't know how, I don't question it, but they still ship parts from there. So as long as I can get parts for my vehicle. Uh, this is a company from Estonia that is very, I've had a good experience with so far. I personally recommend them. And let's say again, lot of 2103. So this is 2101 slash 2107. And let's just look at some of the parts. So let's say I need some brakes. Okay, uh, let's see if we can find some pads or anything like that. Okay, awesome. These are Neva. All right, so these are the pads that, that we would be looking for. And honestly, 20 pounds, actually, would that be euros? I'm an American, I apologize. 20 euros, so that'd probably be roughly like 25 US dollars, not including shipping for a set of brake pads. Not bad at all. So getting parts for these would not be too difficult. Here is a brake cylinder caliper also for a lot of doesn't seem that complex to come by. And the cool thing about these Ladas is they were all very similar to 103, 2104, 2105, 2106, you get what I'm saying. They're all very similar even between the different models. And you can see that with the price range or the model range here, 2101 to 107, where all of these parts are clumped together because for the most part, they're very similar or the same. So it's kind of almost like buying parts for like a square body pickup truck in the state side. They made these for such a long span that the parts are so very common because they didn't switch them up. And the cool thing about the Soviet market is there wasn't really a lot of changes. They kind of got stuck in time. And what I mean by that's a cool thing. You could get like a 1985 Lada. It would still look like a 1970 Lada. It's not like with capitalism where every five, six years, you know, they're doing an update or a change or a remodel, redesign. They didn't really care about that in the Soviet Union. Did the vehicle, the vehicle, does it perform its function? Does it move? Okay, good. We don't need to change anything. So because of that, if you're really into older cars, the cool thing about this, for example, my UAS Lukanka, is you can get a newer car that might be slightly more reliable, maybe, possibly, but they made them for a longer period of time, but it looks like an older vehicle. So if you wanted to find an 80s, 90s lot, it would still look like a classic and you could still import those anything I currently right now 98 or older you can import in the US so these are just a couple examples of websites I know there are probably a lot more there actually is a lot of parts store in Miami that I've referenced in another one of my videos I personally visited so getting parts supplies is not that difficult another cool thing given the fact that this is based off the Fiat 124 if you need somebody to work on your vehicle anybody that can work on an old Fiat could work on your lot of here so it's kind of the best of both worlds. You still get some exotic car, but it is still roughly, or it is based on a Fiat 124, which was sold in the US. So therefore, theoretically speaking, between the good parts availability 
and the fact that they were sold in the U.S., you shouldn't have too many difficulties getting somebody to work on it or working on it yourself and finding information. So have, I guess, the importation process of this, how many of these are over in the U.S.? Is it worthwhile to import them in the U.S.? And if you've seen any of my previous content, you know I have talked about uh, a lot about importing vehicles into the U.S. that were never sold in the U.S. and the process of doing so. So this is a cool website that I stumbled upon a little while ago, and you can actually search import data to see how many vehicles are officially imported in the U.S. So this is just a lot of 1500, so this would be the same model that Tristan has, for example. And as of now, it's saying that four of these vehicles were imported in the U.S. Uh, Bremerhaven, which is in Germany, is like one of the main railroad ports. So it does not surprise me that this is on the list here. And this is one from Singapore. Again, these vehicles were sold almost everywhere except for the U.S., unfortunately. We kind of get ripped off on that. But you could see that there are a few, the last one being in 2023, that have been imported in the U.S. Now, if we want to go to not the export name, but the domestic name, which is the 2103, say vehicle, how many of these have been imported? Now it says that number jumps up to seven. So again, Bremer having a lot of them, St. Petersburg, I'd imagine that's St. Petersburg, Russia. And it's kind of cool to check out how many of these and where they're being shipped to Baltimore, Maryland, Miami, so on and so forth. Um, and this website is pretty cool. For example, if I search up US 452, which I imported a couple years ago, sure enough, it has the import information right there. I did import from Baltimore, and this, I would imagine, 2021 was the vehicle that I personally imported. So if you are curious about how many vehicles have been imported into the U.S., I guess through ports, uh, vehicles that were never sold domestically in the U.S., it's kind of interesting to find that data. Here's my Fiat Panda, for example, that should be here somewhere. I think that's right here. Very interesting to check out. Anyway, moving on here. So let's say you want to buy a lot of 2103. Again, you could probably find a decent one of these for around maybe two or three grand in the Eastern block. Obviously, if you want to go more into the Western block, which shipping would be way easier, the process would be way easier, but now you're definitely increasing your cost quite a bit. And that's when you start seeing, if I can move the green here, that's when you start seeing costs such as yeah, what we have here, 14 grand, 13 grand. Obviously, I would not spend this much on a Lada. It is a rear-wheel drive, four-cylinder vehicle. Not necessarily known for reliability, but it is a fun car to drive around. Uh, cool thing, I guess, referencing back to my site, Uaz America, which I cannot recommend enough. Nevas are already a vehicle that we sell if you want to have a Vaz 2103, also known as the Lotta 1500. Again, please contact UAS America. I would have no problem doing the consultation. We can hook you up. Like I said, it would probably cost a few grand by the time we do everything. It's going to be a little cheaper than a 4x4 vehicle just because there's less parts. The vehicles themselves are cheaper, so set them around 12 grand. By the time we go through shipping, the entire process, customs, whatnot, it would probably be closer to around 10 grand, which is still cheaper than what you would get if you try to find one of these in Belgium or the Netherlands, for example. So I would definitely recommend that if you are interested in these vehicles. Uh, what type of use would these vehicles have? That's another thought that comes up to mind. Again, I think this would be a good summer car. I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this for the winter. You'd probably be better off with a Neva, an UAS, or basically anything that I sell on UAS America. You'd probably be best off with. But let's say you live down in Florida or something. Again, these vehicles, I really doubt you're probably not going to get them with AC. I don't know what the cost would be to get one of those fitted with AC. I'm sure it is definitely a possibility. These cars are very simple to work on. Uh, I would definitely say, again, good summer cruiser. You probably get decent mileage, and they're very simple, bare bones to work on. You're not going to have to worry about uh, messing around with fuel injections, ECUs, catalytic converters, or any of that stuff. Again, before you import one of these, I would definitely recommend check out what your state requirements are for importation. Do you have a vehicle inspection? Again, I, these aren't going to have catalytic converters. Even if you import a 96, 97, you're probably still not going to have one. If you live in a state that has smog inspections, for example, you might not pass. And I don't know what the availability of getting one of these retrofitted with a catalytic converter or an O2 sensor would be. So that's something you definitely want to check out. If you live in a state like Georgia or Florida, except for 
Atlanta that doesn't require any sort of vehicle inspection, I would say it's definitely worthwhile. I definitely think vehicle-wise they would retain their value. And like I said, if you look at the import data of these, like I was just showing, only a few of these have been imported in the U.S. And especially with the situation going on with Russia and Ukraine, I feel like that number is dwindling down. So you would have an oddity just for scarcity alone. I would definitely say that having a Lada 2103 would, or Boz 2103 would definitely retain its value. And I think it would be a worthwhile investment. So anyway, uh, that's it for the video. Like I said, I just thought I would change it up a little bit. Uh, kind of talk about something different that is still somewhat odd or e exotic vehicle related. Check out my website, wasamerica.com, if you want any information on actually importing any of these. Again, we specialize in 4x4, but anything Soviet related, we can definitely probably work something out. Also, check out my merchandise page. I am putting new shirts up all the time. I'm trying to keep the blog also updated. I might make another article after this vehicle. So anything you can find was America. Uh, hopefully pretty soon I'll also have an Instagram page that is in the works right now for anything who was for Soviet vehicles such as this related. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next.